Hi, Hello. Everyone. Hi. This is Norman Bolter. I'm Dr. Carol Vieira, and we have some questions from the students in the trombone studio at Duquesne University. And um, we made part one um, already, and this is part two, and we're going to see how this goes. Um, so here's the question, okay? I'm ready. <laughs> Uh, this is from Joe Van Dyne. He's a junior. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Norman one question. How does he get over his nerves when he performs? Much thanks to him for this. Can I get a little brief history of nerves? Sure. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. Because um, this is also a great question for you. Well, I'll probably say something afterward, but, you know. No, I know. He, he wants to he, I know, you, so. I know, because I've been up there doing this for a long time, and you think, well, that's, it can look easy on TV and everything like that if people have seen, you know, performers play and stuff on TV, which you probably have. Um, but there's different things that go on inside of a person at different times. It's not the same every day, number right. one. Right. It's not that you're hit with the same level of nervousness every time you perform. Um, at least that's my situation, because it is very individual. Mm -hmm. But even from what I've seen in different ensembles I've been, you can tell when someone's a little more, you know, um, right. uptight, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, and you can tell when someone's feeling more relaxed and it's one of those days where there's more fluidity and conductivity going on between yourself and the music and the conductor. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you something interesting. I never thought about nerves when I was nine years old and picked, first picked up the trombone and was playing, right? I just was having a great time until um, in December for a little Christmas show in front of parents and everyone else. They said, you're next. And I went, okay. And as soon as they said, you're next, <laughs> okay, and I was getting my trombone ready, I had a wave of nerves in my stomach that was incredible. And I really felt it bad. Now, that was at nine years old. Right. And I went out there and I played, I guess, who knows? I guess it was fine. I wasn't horrible once I was out there, but it felt like for a while it was like, woo! really intense. Now, I'm going to go back in time just one little bit more. Well, not one little bit more. That one little bit more is probably three or four years before that when I used to go to art school. I used to have to get on a bus and be with other students, going to this art thing with people I did not know. And before I'd leave the house, I'd have a really bad nervous stomachache. And even sometimes before going to the school, before going to school when, when I was younger, I'd be kind of uptight and nervous in my stomach. That's the way it expressed itself. And I'm bringing this up because there were other times that I felt nerves. <laughs> right. Besides playing the trombone. Right. For me, and mm -hmm. I think that's an important point. Yeah. So how do I deal with it? You know, in different situations, I'm going to be really simple about it. If your part isn't a big, giant solo part, probably not going to get that nervous. At least I didn't. Um, if I'm playing a solo in front of the band or orchestra, like I did a lot in high school, sometimes I'd really feel it. Sometimes I wouldn't. I almost couldn't predict when it would happen. Sometimes in a big circumstance, I wouldn't be nervous. And sometimes... When there was a smaller audience, I'd feel it more. And so I totally couldn't pre um, predict when those nerves would hit me. But the more I started to play all the time and all the time, there was periods in my life where it was much more quelled, okay, where I wasn't feeling it. Even with the TV camera in front of my face playing a pop solo, I'd feel it. But because of the nature of the slow, solo and you get to move your slide for slide vibrato <laughs> and all that, I felt freer. 
So uh, number one, let me just say a couple of things because it's a big topic, but do you want to come in at this point? No, do you, you just okay. go ahead and, and if maybe I'll put in something. I was always prepared. And we talked about this on the other video. Mm -hmm. I was always prepared. If I had big solos in the orchestra, believe me, I was more than prepared. Not only physically, I had my relationship with the music up front, and I did not leave that relationship with the music when the conductor pointed at me. Okay? Or when the TV camera came along. Yes, it's distracting, but I really stayed within my storyline of the piece of music I was playing. As a matter right. of fact, one time in Carnegie Hall, I was playing, I, when I was playing principal in the BSO, uh, when Mr. Barron was on sabbatical, we're doing Mahler 5. We did a lot of big things that year. And uh, even my health was maybe a teeny bit weaker than it could have been that year in 96. Mm -hmm. It's kind of tough. But um, I remember for each of the big trombone solos, there was one of my grandfathers I thought of and another family member, ones I had good rapport with and a certain sentiment about them that fit the music. And so I wasn't thinking about, oh, here I am playing this in Carnegie Hall, or here I am, you know, doing this live on the radio. I was with my relatives. Now, for me, that helped a great deal. Anytime I had a great relationship with the piece, um, that's what I would do. I would make sure... I knew what the piece meant to me, whether through imagery, th whether through association with nature, or with another person like a relative. I've done many things sometimes thinking of my dear wife playing a solo. Okay? So those things have an association of making a person relax a little bit more, feel at home. Sometimes I think of my grandma too, because she always made me feel great when I was playing, or even my mom or my dad. And um, sometimes even, even other kinds of thoughts that would get me going like, I'm doing this for my honor and for the music's honor and for that which wrote the music through the composer. So all sorts of things. I don't personally fall back to certain things um, um, like Enderall, like certain people might. I'm not making a judgment call on that. For me, I didn't do it because I think there's other ways to go about it that maybe, uh, for me, were better. Okay? Mm -hmm. I can't speak for everyone else on this subject. It's a very personal one. Um, but that's a little bit of it, what helped me. And uh, things I still have to do sometimes. And it, some people don't seem to have as big of an issue with it, and some do. I think some people are more sensitive to that situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where I know you've talked about the broader picture of that before. Yeah, this, you know, it, I don't want to interfere with what you're not finished. I am done. Okay, I, I mean, that, I that, was, that was great, and that, you know, coming from your personal. And one of the things, you actually brought up something that I wanted to bring up in this part two that we didn't really get into in, in part one, and that's that we come... Well, each of us in our own way, but with the same basic template, um, address the people we're working with and anything we do from what we call the three overlays. And um, you can see in some of the other of Norman's videos, or maybe if you know our work, what that that might involve. But it's it involves one the robotic part, you know, the the, the details, the the technical aspects of it. You know, two the how you take that skill and how you bring it together. You know, and and three, integration and in art, which is, to me, it has to do a lot with connection. It has to, it really has to do with the kind of the quality of the connection that you have, and you are bringing in connection, and how much connection really can um, pull together a lot of things. And I think we might be talking about that a little more. It's we don't have the time in this to really get into that. Um, but I wanted to just address it so that you could have it on your mind and maybe check it out other places that we've talked about it or, you know, if we ever see you face-to-face -face or whatever, we can, you will definitely see an, a demonstration of that. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to say. And, and when 
when I think about it, as you know, even at the very basic level, even at the, the first overlay, um, you know, I talk about um, technique as a living thing and that how even in the beginning you can bring your connection into it, your third overlay connection into your working on the technique. So it's not all of a sudden you find yourself in, oh, if I think of some kind of, you know, image or whatever to bring to this and you try to kind of like slap it on at the end, like sometimes you'll see, and this is not to disparage anyone else's approach if it works for them, is that um, people will get very resistant about thinking of any kind of imagery or storyline until they get all the notes down. And I understand that, and I understand because you want to know, you want to do that practical aspect. But, but my argument is, is uh, with it is, if you know why you're even doing that technical thing, why are you? Why do you want that phrase to be um, a certain way? Why do you want that articulation to be a certain way? Why do you want that dynamic? And why would you even choose that dynamic if you don't have one provided? Or how would you actually work with that dynamic? If it's within the context of a story, it actually, or your purpose, or why you're doing it, then it makes it not just a mechanical exercise. It has a purpose of where this is going to go, and it already is tying in the other overlays, and it's bringing the highest, in a way of speaking, because it's the purposeful. It's the heartfelt overlay in from the beginning and not just trying to go get through the grunt work so we can put a story on that sometimes just sounds like, you know, something slapped on and really doesn't always, you know, really have anything right. to do with it. It doesn't, you don't feel the integration. Now, the reason I'm saying all that is just to introduce the overlays that really apply to even the, the things we were talking to Will about in our last video. So, Will, you might see how some of this might apply to your situation because it most certainly has a place when you talk about nerves, mm -hmm. like you just demonstrated. Um, because even if you have nerves and you know why you're doing it, your love of the music, that you're trying to bring music to others that might be, it uplift their life, you're doing a what we call a transmission that way. You're projecting into the world. What can this do to be of service? Then, you mm -hmm. know what? Then, and you know, I go through this too. And I have, when I performed, you know, go through it. Um, that all of a sudden, it doesn't, the nerves don't matter as much. And it doesn't mean you don't have them all the time. That's important. But you are, you're doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Because you have a reason to show up. Mm -hmm. And you have a reason to have your voice be heard, even if that isn't, you know, like what you think is the perfect way that it would give expression. Mm -hmm. Because that's above and beyond that. So um, that's one thing I wanted to say. With, but really this matter of nerves is a, is a complex subject. But there are certain simple ways you can think about it. And this is one way in terms of, how do you approach it, you know, as a performer or whatever you might do that might put you in that position. But um, it's also worth knowing, you know, just in case it's an easement too, uh, is that over 90% of classical musicians report having had nerves in a performing situation so great that it impaired their ability to play as they might want to. Now, what does that tell us? What does that, I can tell you what it tells me, is that if it's 90%, Okay, then that, if you look at that in terms of statistics, in the, you know, how statisticians and think about it and researchers think about it, then that's normal. That's more than normal. I mean, that's the majority of the people. Mm -hmm. But we know that that's not really healthy. So how can it be healthy and normal and not healthy? Well, one, one of the things it says is <laughs> that it is not your personal deficit. Right. It is not a, a, an individual problem. The fact that this happens, it's a collective problem. It's a collective problem that reflects something about the way we go on as a culture and the way we go on as a profession. And uh, there, that there's room for healing here. But if nothing else, until we get to that point, um, it certainly is a conversation worth having. But I, I would hope that knowing that, it would take some of the pressure off individuals because you can think, well, there's something wrong with me, and I've got to hide it, and that I've got to try to get through this. No, it isn't. It's, it, it's, it's a collective problem, 
And depending on your degree of sensitivity, for any given um, number of reasons, you might manifest it more than someone else. Now, um, what are some, might some of those reasons be? Um, that, you know, you're, why are you more sensitive? Um, well, you know, it can be constitutional things. It can be, there's a lot more people who have experienced trauma of some kind or other than um, anybody realizes. And I'm not even talking about dramatic trauma. We have trauma that we don't even understand. And this isn't the time to get into that. But um, just about anyone, I think anyone that I've met has had some trauma that they don't actually understand how much it influences what, what they do, either individually or, you know, as a, on a acute one-off situation, a car accident, um, you know, or, you know, other kinds, you know, with other people. Personal stuff, family or, or, stuff. Or, fam you know, family, state, developmental trauma or exposed to difficult situations in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a number of reasons why it can happen. But even, even something like, um, as a child, neglect. It's trauma. We don't realize. Well, we think, well, I wasn't, you know, like I didn't have a, you know, I didn't have a, a, a you know, a parent who was a substance abuser or whatever. Or maybe you did. But say it was seemingly the, the most ideal situation. But maybe both parents were. And you didn't have like a grandmother or somebody close and you were in a situation where, you know, someone else took care of you that, you know, they were caring, but they didn't really have an in investment in you. And unless it was like, you know, other time with, with parents or whatever, and depending how you were, um, maybe it left, left a, you know, a mark. So, um, and that's, that's part of life. That's what I'm saying. A lot of people have this in one form or another, but it has, it affects one's feeling of safety and one's feeling of being sure of what's going to happen around them. And, and what is this when we, when there's nerves involved? It really comes down to you. Do you feel safe or not? And we talked a little bit about that with Will. Mm -hmm. And and if you're a particularly sensitive, you're canary to pick up. This is not a safe situation. And let's face it. From what I just said, the number of you know the collective problem that we have, a performing situation frequently is not a safe situation. Now, is somebody trying to make that unsafe? No. It's a it's what's happened with our culture. Audition situation is definitely not a safe situation. And does that committee want to make you feel unsafe? No, of course not. That's not, well, you know, no, by no, and large, no, they don't. Yeah, no. um, but, that, but, it, but it is, you know, and, and because if you're particularly sensitive, you're like what I call a canary, okay? And if you don't, I, I'm surprised at how many people don't have that reference, but, but Google it. Uh, it's to do with canaries that were used in coal mines, that if canary be, felt sick, then the, the miners would know that there was danger, that there was gas in the mine, you know, there, there was something bad about to happen, so they could evacuate. And so, really, the people who are the most sensitive and pick up these things, they're like the early warning system, that something's not right, that we need to attend to here. And it's an early warning system for yourself that you don't feel safe. So how do you then make it so you feel more safe? in that situation. We got into a little bit of that with Will. Again, I've gone way over what I expect. But I'll tell you one, one study that came out recently, because this, this is counterintuitive. And it was done with police officers. And they were out doing their thing that police officers do on their beat, whatever you call it. Uh, and um, they had two different kinds of, of, of cops that they were following. And one of, the, one of the types was, like, they were more vigilant. They were, like, really aware of what's going on, and they were, like, you know, and you'd say, oh, boy, you know, they're not chill, right? And then they have the ones that would kind of chill, you know, they're just out there, whatever. Now, which ones do you think measured as being more anxious? Ironically, it was the ones who were chill. It wasn't the ones that were looking, you know, were vigilant. Now, they weren't vigilant, hypervigilant, like paranoid. They were aware of their surroundings, and their, their body felt safe because it knew you were, taking, it, you were taking care of it. You were looking out for the circumstance. And so, again, like we were talking about with Will, you projected and matched your way of going on to the circumstance that you found yourself in, which created greater safety. 
Whereas the people who kind of like the cops that were more chill, their body knew, wait a minute, dude, you know, you're going to, you know, you're not aware. This isn't the safest situation. We could get blindsided any moment. So there was more stress there. So again, it's that projection to actually know, okay, this, this is, this is the way it is. So what can I do to, um, to find my way within that? Um, um, and, and your body really does know. Um, if your body's reacting a certain way, one of the reasons not to kind of stop it, unless there's a good reason to stop the reactions you're having, is that it's telling you something. The body is extremely intelligent, and it's only always trying to make things right. It's only always trying to heal, to balance, to find homeostasis, okay? So if it's doing something, you know, you might want to ask why, because it's intelligent. And so if you can find that and you can soothe it or you can heal it or you can settle it or whatever it create, whatever it takes to put it into balance, that's maybe a, an approach to, to consider. All right. So I've gone on way more than I wanted. And these videos are meant to be informational, instructional, not to diagnose a treat. If you need that kind of intervention, please go to your professionals, you know, um, that you work with to do that. But um that was kind of a lot, but that was kind of what turned out. No, that, that was great. That was great. I just want to add one little thing, and I know it, it has to be little. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Um, and looking at the three overlay system that was brought up, you know, I think it's brilliant. You know, we think, okay, we're going to build a house. And then once all the bricks and everything else is in place, then we can do other stuff inside of it. And then eventually people will be able to live in it. Okay? But where did the house come from? The house came from inspiration. Well, let's say it did. It came from an inspiration about wanting something. So someone's building their own house. They're probably building it with that inspiration, mm -hmm. not with the up, not always with the uptightness of "I got to get this right." Mm -hmm. Right. So I think sometimes players, and they're in college and stuff, or after they graduate high school, all of a sudden they realize, "Wow, okay, now I'm, I have to be better than than I was. I was known to be a good player in high school." Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm in another circumstance. Mm -hmm. You are getting a little close to, oh, then school will be over, and I'm supposed to be doing something to make money, and mm -hmm. I want to do something that I love. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm in music, and maybe it's the thing I think I do the best, whatever the reasons are. And all of a sudden, people who are really interested in performing start thinking, okay, all these bricks have to be even more perfect. Yeah. Now, how about ref refine them a bit? Instead of thinking... They have to be absolutely, you know, so flawless. Because any house, yes, some are really put together well, and the measurements are great. Nothing as good as the pyramids of ancient Egypt, though. <laughs> but but they're, they're really good. But they're not probably perfect over time. They probably start to change mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is whistle while you work. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> Remember from, I don't know, Snow White yeah. or whatever? Right. Because... Instead of thinking, this note has to be perfect, think of other things that are going to get you into the district of making the foundations vibrant, mm -hmm. alive, mm -hmm. and wonderful. Right. Not like, okay, this is sturdy, and then we'll put something more beautiful on top of this. Has to... No, there's a beauty in stability. Right. Where is the art in staccato? Where is the art of intonation. Mm -hmm. And what you find out is, and everything isn't just one thing. Everything is a combination of different things. So good intonation is a combination of steadiness, which maybe manifests into the air, into the embouchure. Mm -hmm. And once you can get into working in a way that is musical, music is a living, a technique is a living thing, then you'll integrate that movement and that art inside your fundamentals, which will then make them a wonderful living art house for the spirit of the music to be inside of. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So that's one way to make yeah. sure you're always in that glow. Right. As opposed to, okay, these have to be perfect. Because mm -hmm. that's the beginning. And I've seen it. And I've been teaching at the college level for a very long time, over 43 years. That people start getting very, very stiff in mm -hmm. college thinking, okay, it has to be more perfect. Right. Right. And therefore, that's the start of a whole worry of tension right. that we were hitting on yesterday. Right, because they think that's where they're going to find their stability, but that's not actually where stability is. It has to be this this balance of being aware of your situation and matching that and bringing in your love. And like we talked about, don't let anything come between you and that. And that is really the height of the third mm -hmm. overlay. Remember Japan? In Japan... Oh. You know, if they built just all their buildings really just like a brick, right. when the big storms would come through, they'd fall down. <laughs> and the earthquakes, I meant. Yeah. They'd break. So when earthquakes come into us as people, why don't we have a little bit more little sway? Little. Exactly. That's exactly. going to be a much stronger foundation. Exactly. exactly. So just, yeah. I don't oh, know, that came up. I, that, that was great. And there's just so much more we could say about it. I could even feel like thinking this and that. and But obviously, hopefully, you know. Joe, that, there's something that, in there. There's something in there for you and whoever is listening. We, you know, we, we, and we're always available for people to get in touch. Right. And we know that some that this might open some of that up. Right. So just to say that. Exactly. Exactly. <coughs> so now there's... Because, uh, yeah. Scott Wheeler, and he's a first-year grad. So, no, we're on this Oh, one. okay. Okay? Yeah. Um, I find myself only being able to focus on one thing at a time when practicing. How can I work towards seeing more of a big picture rather than having tunnel vision? Well, right off the bat, something that we've already said is that connection mm -hmm. from the beginning, from even your technique. Why are you doing this? Because you're absolutely right. It can be difficult. How do you think of all those things? Well, you can't if you're thinking of them as separate compartmentalized things because, in fact, we weren't meant to multitask. We weren't meant to try to think of too many things at once. But if you in, if you think from the beginning of why are you doing, you know, this your your articulation that way? Why are you doing your phrasing that way? Why are you doing any number of things that you would do at a technical level and bring in this technique as a living thing? Well, this piece is about this or it means this to me or I want it to mean this to me or whatever fits. And if you don't quite know what that is when you're starting working with a piece, just bring even your love or just bringing your like, oh, your excitement or your adventure, your curiosity. Mm -hmm. And then that can evolve into whatever your story is. As you see things emerging, you go, oh, that could be that. Or you might know what some of what the composer's story was if they had <laughs> one. And, if, and, it, and, and you might not even exactly use that, but you might think, oh, but that reminds me in my own life. Because the more you can make it personal, the more you can bring yourself into the picture the more that you're taking other parts of your brain, other parts of your, your um, heart-mind access and integrating all that into a whole that you can access all at once. And if you're not thinking of all those details you know, um, at any one time, at some point in your preparation, if you've approached it this way, you just let go and throw it yourself inside that connection completely and trust your preparation. So this is where preparation comes into it again, too. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, you probably want to say some things, but that just came to me. No, about, that, was, know, get inside that was great because, again, it's emphasizing. Sometimes people think third third overlay, you know, we go one, two, and then the third overlay of where our purpose is. No, it actually starts with purpose. All right. It might not seem like that, but it does. And then looking at this, Scott, um, first of all, on a practical level, what is one thing at a time? Mm -hmm. If you're going to say, okay, today I'm going to work on articulation, you think that's one thing. But that one thing takes many things exactly, in order to manifest, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Even at the practical first overlay looking at it. First overlay is our automatic robotic system, our physical system, there's many things that go into the first overlay, and that's one aspect. It's a robotic system. So we're training ourselves. So our attitude gets trained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. you know, what Dr. V was also talking about is if you're not bringing your love into it, then what else gets into your robotic mm -hmm. habit life? Mm -hmm. You know, anger, 
Frustration? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So sometimes that happens. But with looking at this, always realize that one thing takes many things. So you're not just working on one thing. Right. And this can be an area where people think just this one thing. They're forgetting about all the other things that people are just focusing on the embouchure. I don't call it embouchure anymore. I call it embouchure. Because so you're always, as soon as you say embouchure, your air is with you. That that duet is always there. Articulation. Art. Articulation. So you're, there's many different, if we were going to analyze what it took for you to buy just one middle B flat, <laughs> we'd write an encyclopedia of all the different brain functions, the, the different systems that play, what's mm -hmm. going on in your body, what's going on with your tongue and your teeth and your mouth, and how your diaphragm is supporting and what your lungs are doing. That'd be a very, very big book, okay, of many volumes. So right. I'm just saying that get inside of the, it's your workshop, your practice room. Right. It's your experimental theater. It's where you can go, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I'm working on one thing. Make a list of all, all many different things it takes to make those one things. Seeing how they're going, then combine them. And sometimes I'll say, okay, right now, I'm going to play this Bordoni exercise, and I'm going to have a little formula. I'm going to think air and rhythm. Right. And then I say, okay, now I'm going to think intonation and legato. And you'll find combinations that might be the perfect one for you, like Arnold Jacobs' perfect little thing for him was wind right. and song. Mm -hmm which is a very big statement, actually. So for me, I'm just saying, well, there's many different angles. Some people are really rhythm people. And once they get that rhythm going, you know, rhythm and tune. I don't know, but there's many different ways. So that's really worth experimenting for. Yeah. You can even experiment yeah. that with nerves, too. Right. And this will help you not move into this. I'm looking at your paper here. That's why I'm pointing down about your question. It'll keep your tunnel vision... Instead of like this, more surround vision. Right. Right. So it won't be so narrow. You'll see that it takes many to do the one. And if you're coming from the bigger picture, I'm doing this small exercise over and over. I do, I reapproach. I do, I reapproach. Mm -hmm. I reload. Then you also won't get stuck in a rut, which creates a very big tunnel. Right. going sometimes not very far. And so the big picture is coming from the purpose. I'm doing this because I want to have more opportunity and choices in my art. Yeah. And so, one more thing of what yeah. you said, mm -hmm. it, see what happens when we start getting going, um, is that you brought up the matter of attitude. Mm -hmm. And that was clearly part of everything we've been saying. But I want to just um, point out that the brain is negatively biased. It's biased toward, you know, glass half empty. And so when things go wrong, and there's good reason for that because, you know, you get to feel that over the, <laughs> over the centuries, whatever, um, that's a survival approach, right? Um, but so when you're going down that road, you might want to rewrite it, you know, because you're not stuck with a script that you've been practicing, which is like, you know, oh no, oh no, oh no, this, you know, why am I doing this? And why do I have nerves? Oh, why do I have tunnel vision? Oh, why do I, it, but you can practice something else. Just like if you want to correct something in your music by saying, well, I have a bad habit. Well, you practice, you start practicing with something different instead. You override it. And what great thing about the nervous system is you can re rewire it. And so when you find yourself doing that, you might just want to stop up and, and rewrite that and go, okay, well, what is it? What, back to the third, why am I doing this? The technique is a living thing. The, the making music is a living thing. Your career is a living thing. Why are you doing it? You know, uh, why are you in music? Why do you want to put yourself through what this is going to take to keep going? And then just find and then remind yourself of those things. You know, even if there are some pitches in your mind or some pieces of music, have those at the ready that you can play to yourself or look at or, or certain um, memories that you have that you can tap back into and refresh yourself. 
and have yourself be more in that attitude and go and re reapproach and go, yeah, this is why I'm doing it. Let's go onward, right? No, so. that was great. That was really, really great. And sometimes practicing in small little bits. Yeah. You know, you want to find Don't out burn when that yourself tunnel. Again. Yeah. You want to find out when that tunnel starts to form. Yeah. Try practicing in five-minute segments. Mm-hmm. Play something through once. The rest of the time, be very, very detailed. Go back and really, really nitpicky. Play it through again. Those three steps within five minutes. Break. Yeah. Right. Take See, a break for ten. You've now entered <laughs> infinity. <laughs> and we're friends with infinity, yeah. so we'll eventually end within the course of this next eternity. <laughs> No, we had we have one more question. One more. Um, it, should we end this video and get or try to get this one? You know, or try to answer. Well, this right is, now it's thirty-five minutes. So this one. Okay. All right. Let's we'll, try. Well, let's try it because I think maybe a lot of it has been addressed. It's a great question, actually. Uh, this is Robert Good, and he's an undergrad freshman. What was it like being placed in a serious performing atmosphere at such a young age? What did you do to be just as strong as the more experienced players around you? Right. Some, first, of all, first of all, excellent question. And all of them have been questions that um, will mean something to a lot of people besides yeah. yourselves. So exactly. bravo, everyone, for having those questions. This is, is an interesting one in the sense that um, I addressed the first half of it in yesterday's tape. I think. What was it like being placed in, a, in yesterday's video? What was it like? Yeah, being, about the daunting. Yeah. What was it like? Yes, it feels like yesterday. But <laughs> what was it like being placed in such a serious performing atmosphere at such a young age? I said I'd been preparing for it ever since I was 10. So that was accumulative. Yes, it was a, no matter what, the BSO was a level up mm -hmm. from the other stuff I was doing. But I didn't feel for me, because of my preparation and my mental projection at such a young age, I didn't feel um, totally out of place. But I'll tell you what, I was soaking up as much as I could from those players that I loved and respected. And they were there. And so I almost felt protected being with them in mm -hmm. a certain kind of way. I learned from them. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, you're on your own. Goodbye. You know, woo. <laughs> it wasn't like that. I really didn't feel like that. Even though within the first week of me, even it was my audition week playing with the orchestra, those video cameras were right on the trombones and Berlioz, um, Romeo and Juliet, and just big trombone stuff all alone. The cameras were right there, but I was in the section and we were having a good time and we all felt strong. And so um, just to say that, because a lot of that I think was covered mm -hmm. and maybe more, if more will come, we'll talk about it. What did you do um, to be just as strong as the more experienced players around you? I think I just answered that. I learned from them. I saw what they were doing. Was there things they were doing that I wasn't doing? How did they prepare? Okay. Preparation. Preparation. The real serious ones that I respected, it's not saying I didn't respect a lot of people, but there's some you gravitate to more than others, right? Human beings, right? There's some we're attracted to more than others. They were prepared. There were a couple that were really big naturals that I think from doing it so long, they knew how to get it together really quickly. <laughs> and that comes from experience. Yeah, that and comes knowing, with time. <clears throat> And knowing what they can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Some people know that certain things they can't eat. Sorry, I got something in my throat. Right. Certain people know before a concert, I can't do this. Right. I play better if I get a nap before and I eat right. two hours before. Right. <clears throat> this is where the lifestyle things that, that I always work on with people come into it to make you more resilient in certain ways to do with your eating, which can be different for a performance situation than your 
you know, regular maintenance diet. It could be, you know, what's your sleep patterns <clears throat> like? What, you know, what are just any number of things within your lifestyle that you can bring in to make yourself more resilient um, and um, have greater endurance, have greater um, groundedness, many things. Uh, so if maybe I felt fine having a couple of pieces of pizza an hour in advance. I was always there at least an hour in advance warming up before the concert. Maybe I'd have a couple of pieces of pizza. That didn't seem to bother me. If I had to do that now, it'd be a mess. <laughs> and, and that doesn't work for everybody. So that the so thing it is changes. Finding, yeah, and it changes. It changes. Time. It really does change. Some people feel better with a little more protein before, with the right amount of carbohydrate. I mean, you know all about that. And, but it's yeah, I've seen people do different things. And some just like, huh, how can you do that before you play? It worked for them at that point in time. At that point in time, and it's different Because it can change. And it's a matter of knowing <coughs> yourself and bringing your strengths to bear to make you stronger in that situation. So I also want to say an interesting thing about someone coming in young. Yeah, exactly. You know what? Sometimes the older players feed off your energy. Because right. they think you're not as, you're not as kind of crunched down not over time. You know, or, or not as kind of weighted. Yeah. And you're coming in fresh and everything's new. Still enthusiastic. And they feed off that. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry That's about excellent. that. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so um, folks, we hope that this is useful. And thanks. Certainly. Yeah. Thanks, um, for a while. Jim, Jim Nova, um, this excellent students in studio. And, um, Maybe we'll get to um, see some or all of you at another time. And uh, we hope that this was helpful to you. And bye to you all. Take care. Take care. <laughs>